Hi, everybody, and welcome again. Uh, we're having another great time and talk with Father Daryl and myself. I'm coming to you from the beautiful beachy shores here in Pennsylvania, which if you know anything about PA, we have no beach. So enjoy the virtual background. Pastor Daryl is in lovely West Virginia, and I'm affectionately dubbing this show Live Action with Pastor Daryl, otherwise known as the LAPD, <laughs> because we are goofy and ridiculous Christians. We've got to have acronyms, folks. So I don't know if that's going to stick, Father, but we'll just go ahead and go with that. Uh, so today we want to uh, welcome you to a time of pulling out your notebooks, um, even sitting down with a cup of coffee. As we discuss something important today, what we're going to be talking about is putting some tools in your spiritual tool belt, particularly for an important issue and topic about how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible. And we're going to be looking at this long and uh, sometimes scary word called epistemology. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, so epistemology in real simple layman terms is how we know what we know. So how do we know things are true? How do we know that they're right? And so John Wesley, in his notes, gives us something that Father Darrell is going to elaborate on a step by step, is the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And uh, just in brief outline, if you're taking notes, it is um, a way which we interpret scripture and truth, this epistemology, how we understand it via scripture, tradition, logic, and experience. Scripture, tradition, logic, and experience. There's some variation here or there depending on what you read notes wise. So I'm going to ask Father Qu Daryl questions about this as we go along and uh, you take notes. And then uh, below, we want you to start writing us some questions that we can cover in some of these live, uh, live meetings that we're having. So uh, Pastor Daryl, would you share with us um, why it's important even to have an epistemology or have this type of tool belt in your, in your, in your spiritual tool bag? One of the most important things that happens when we approach the scripture to hear the Lord is that we're not aware that we are bringing things with us. Yeah, it's good. So what ends up happening is we, we are um, like, I don't have a Bible in front of me. They're all over there. But let's, let's assume for a second that, that this is my Bible, okay? That's my prayer book, but let's just assume it's second for it's my Bible. One of the great mistakes that we think is that we think that we just approach the text without a pair of glasses on, without, without shades, that we can just approach the Scripture and we can read the scripture and know what it means um, just because we, we are reading it in our native language. Yeah. That's not true. Um, I wish it was, wish it was that easy. M most things are, let me back up for a second and say that, you know, probably 70 to 80% of things that the scripture says are pretty, pretty easily discernible to anybody that, that is able to read. Um, but there are particular theological distinctions, distinctives, emphases, happening uh, in the scripture that we don't understand unless someone teaches us. And, and the first thing you've got to do is to understand that when you're approaching scripture and you're reading scripture, you are importing your own worldview. Mm -hmm. And the longer you read the Bible, the more apparent that becomes you'll read because you'll read things in the text of scripture that immediately make you offended because it doesn't resonate with contemporary perspectives. Um, and that's when some people quit reading. Like I've known people that will quit reading the Bible because they'll start in Genesis. And by the time they get to the Exodus where God is saving Israel from the Red Sea, uh, they quit reading because they don't, they, they have such a bias towards of all things, Jewish people that yeah. they'll quit reading the Bible. Yeah. Why does God keep saving the Jews uh, as if they are special? I mean, I've, I've heard that from folks. Um, that's an example of imposing, of bringing something with us to the text. Yeah. Um, and not staying in the text long enough for that stuff to get curved. Uh, corrected. So, yeah. So we're seeing how important it is that we recognize that we have this bias, and that we're going to use some tools in our spiritual tool belt. Uh, and today we're talking about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And just as a teaser for the future, we are going to get into a time of uh, understanding basic hermeneutics. So how we uh, get into the nitty gritty of Scripture and we do it right and fair. Um, but today. We're talking about coming to the text, knowing we uh, have Let's take one second. Sorry, Mike. One second to say what the quadrilateral is, because there's a lot of syllables in that word. 
and um, I don't want anybody to to uh, to say, wait a second, I don't think I can listen to what they're going to talk about right now. All right, let's get into it. Go for it, Pastor. Oh, I just was – if you wanted to say what the quadrilateral was, really, um, okay. you know. Okay, so the quadrilateral and, – and, and, and stop me if you want to fill in a little bit more, but uh, Wesley has uh, in his notes basically an understanding that we have to discern truth, to know we're, we're, we're appropriating truth correctly is – we go to scripture first, that is the primary, and then secondarily, we go to tradition or the history of the church, particularly the uh, early church fathers or the uh, patristic fathers, and then logic and reason, uh, and of course, it has to be sanctified logic and reason, and then in the end, we have a basic life experience and experience we bring to the table. I think that's a fair assessment of the, the quadrilateral, or, or we could say the, the four, four quad, you know, the four legs. Um, the four components. And, and for our history buffs, uh, Wesley is an Anglican priest and stays one until, till his entrance into paradise. Um, but he's, he gets his methodology from Richard Hooker, who is one of, uh, Richard Hooker is an undervalued theologian, um, largely because from what I understand anyway, is that his English, if you try to read his ecclesiastical laws, his books, um, they're difficult to get through. So you want to get a, a newer translation, but what, but Richard Hooker is the one that emphasized uh, scripture, tradition, and then reason as reason was, is, is rightly understood and not, not a, a carnal uh, concept. But when you see that the scripture, the tradition, and, and Hooker's lifting that from the early fathers. Right. And so Wesley takes that same pattern and then he does something, um, I don't want to say distinctive, but it is particular to him. And that's when he, he, he takes all of that and then brings experience. What is my experience? What is the experience of the people of God right. in this particular vein? So that's, that's that quadrilateral component um, for those who are interested. But. And so we're just going to jump right in. We're going to take our first tool out. And because we're Anglicans and we're Bible-believing Anglicans, when we're coming up to any topic, Pastor, say we're trying to discern whether or not we know a statement is true from somebody, or maybe there's a blurb on the internet or on the news, and we're trying to figure out, is this truth? Where do we go first? We go to scripture. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Why do we as, as historic Christians, why do we go to scripture first and primary? Scripture is the word of God written. Scripture, the words of scripture are the words of God written. So that when you take the whole gamut of the canon, everything from positive statements of, of declarations of, of faith and confidence to the other side, uh, statements of lamentation and woe and mourning, we see God joining himself with our human experience, not so that he's limited by it, but because he wants us to, to, to grasp that he's, he's sharing with us in our pain. Um, so you've got the highs and the lows so that the words of scripture are the words of the Holy Spirit in time, in place. Yeah. The words of scripture are the words of God in the midst of a people that he created so that he could speak to humanity, which is Israel. And then how then what he spoke in Israel by Israel is for the whole of the church around, uh, well, the whole of church Catholic and when you talk about the church Catholic, we're not talking about just geography. We're talking about eternal, eternality and time. So the church Catholic isn't just who's alive now, but it's the saints behind us and the saints that will come after us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's what scripture is, the words of God. So we want yeah. to go there because it's infallible. It's an errand. Right. And this is that revelation or the revealing of God to us written down so that when we're covering a topic of, of any 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 uh, distinction that we're hearing, we can go we can go to scripture, and we thank God. We thank God not only for His Word, but we have it in our own language. We're so blessed. We're so fortunate to have that. Um, and and so, Father, would you say is there any kind of particular uh, translation or or um, uh, yeah version that would be good for people? The translation that's the best is the one that you'll read. Mm, that's good. It's that's the good. one that you'll read. Yeah. Um, everybody's at a different, a different spot. I mean, um, I've got a, I've got a Bible here. This is, uh, I just, I don't really read out of it much anymore, but it's a King James Bible, which is the, you know, the, the, the biscuits and gravy for some folks. And, and I 
you know, praise the Lord that they're reading it. Um, but I, I've got one, I mean, I've got, I've got that one. I've got uh, English standard versions, new American standard versions, messages, paraphrases, uh, Greek, Hebrew, Latin. I mean, uh, irony of ironies is that I've got, I think, more copies of the Bible on my phone than the Apostle Paul probably ever carried around in a knapsack, um, which is staggering. And I, it speaks to the level of accountability that we have as, as modern people when it comes to the Word of God. Um, so I think for, for people looking to say, well, what is the best translation? Realistically, whichever one you're going to read is the one you need to really invest in. Um, and then once you've gotten past that and you really want to go into study, then we can start talking about things that are that are more literal um, in their translation from a literal idiom, like a, a phrase of speech, to the literal, literal words, um, you know. So, And then for the really super smart people that are able to read Greek and Hebrew, you know, uh, that's sort of like the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Remember that one? The black yeah. with the, yeah. yeah. So, Reading the Bible in English is like reading, uh, it's like watching It's a Wonderful Life in black and white. But then when you read the scripture in Greek and Hebrew, it's like reading it in the Technicolor version that was made. <laughs> so most people tend to enjoy the black and white because they're familiar with it, but you do see the details with the, the color version. That's good. That's good. And so we're, we're historic Christians and we love the word of God. And so that's our first tool. That's what we're going to. If we're trying to figure out what is truth on any matter, primarily we're going to the scripture in a translation that we can, we can, we can understand and we want to read. So well, I think we need to emphasize that that's because scripture is infallible. There's no other authority on the earth. Right. It's infallible. Right. But, the and and it's infallible um in and of itself like it doesn't need us to say it's the authority because what's uh to to refer to that quadrilateral for a second i mean and, and you're not supposed to go in this order but let's just jump down to experience for a second what we see categorically over and over and over and over again through human history is that the word of god quickens people so that whether they know um, deep theological truths or not, something about that word, the word of God coming uh, as the scripture strikes the heart and wakens the heart and brings conviction and brings life and brings power. I mean, because the word of God, uh, we mentioned this yesterday, the sacramental component, the word, the words of God carry the power of God. Right. So we go straight to that infallible authority first, and we, we, we sit there at the feet of Jesus, as it were. And so just in case anybody doesn't know what that word infallible means, just simple, quick layman's terms, what is infallible? There's no error. It's perfect. It's trustworthy. Um, there's nothing in it that's wrong. Um, I like, uh, was it infallible, inerrant, and inspired? You have different levels of inspiration. Uh, but like when we say it's in, in, infallible and inerrant, what we're saying is it doesn't contain anything wrong so every statement that it makes is correct amen amen okay so we're going to scripture first and then we have this next thing that it's probably going to take us a little bit longer to unpack is tradition wesley then says you've gone to the primary you've gone to the highest and now we're going to go to tradition and what why would i want to go to tradition pastor to discern uh whether something's true so tradition is the, uh, in the words of Chesterton, uh, tradition is the, uh, the democracy of the dead. Tradition is not the dead faith of the living. That's traditionalism. So it's not the dead faith of the living. It's the living faith of the dead. The tradition is the memory of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit has spoken in the past based upon the infallible scripture and confirmed it through the consensus understanding of the people of God. So tradition isn't something light. It's not a custom. There's a difference between capital, capital T tradition and between traditions and customs. They're not the same. Yeah. So I uh, mentioned Gregory the Great yesterday. So even when Gregory is writing uh, back to Augustine of Canterbury and they're, and they're having that um, lettered dialogue about, um, about customs and about traditions, and Gregory says, you take the best of the traditions to make a tradition. All of that falls under the umbrella of the apostolic tradition, capital T, tradition. Mm 
so there's a there's a um, a distinction that has to be made there. So then the the next the next level. So once you've qualified that there is a tradition, and um, you got to kind of start to then you can start to parse it a little bit as to what is what's composed of that tradition and what isn't part of that tradition. Um, and this this I don't want it to sound too too academic or too scholastic, uh, because you know if you if you read some of the orthodox theologians, they don't differentiate between scripture and tradition in the same way, because they'll say that scripture is the result of tradition. Well, historically we can see that scripture is um, confirmed by tradition, but we would, because we believe in the infallibility of scripture, we would press the other way, that the tradition is created by scripture. And the scripture is discerned and, and or tradition is discerned and honed and judged by scripture. So we, we would kind of press it more that way, because if you if you argue too strong the other way, you end up with a lot of the med medieval errors that the church had, you know, uh, 600 years ago. Um, so once you've got the capital T tradition, then you kind of you can start unpacking what's part of that, and that that is that is a multi, uh, like that, that's a multi-day, multi-week conversation, um, but it's there. So and and in brief, I, I'll give you a couple examples. One would be the apocrypha or the deuterocanonical books. They're part of the capital T tradition of the church. Um, if you go back and you read the early fathers of the church, you go back and you read the, Jew, the, uh, the Jews, the writings of the Jews, uh, before the church, we, you know, properly speaking, as the body of Christ uh, enters, comes onto the scene, there was disagreement as to what books were canonical. So we know that the Pharisees uh, had the law of Moses, the prophets, the writings. We know that the Essenes, it was the group that may have raised John the Baptist. They had all those books and others, uh, like Jubilees and that kind of stuff. We know that the Sadducees only accepted the laws of Moses. And I bring up those three different groups because in each one of them, there's a, they have different theological distinctives, largely based upon what they consider to be scripture. Now, Jesus, from all appearances, from what we can see in the Gospels, is much more aligned with the Pharisees. Yeah, yeah. And I bring this up because... Um, are the Pharisees aware of what we would call the Apocrypha? Yeah, they knew about it. Um, but was it part of the Hebrew canon? No, it wasn't. Was it part of the Greek canon and read amongst uh, the Greeks and, and, and diaspora? Yes, they did read it. Um, but even then, there's not, uh, there's not a consensus amongst the, the, uh, the synagogue copies of the Septuagint as to what books were apocryphal in this sense and what weren't but we know that they had them and we know that they were aware of them so that when we're talking about uh tradition here as it writes, relates to these apocryphal texts um if you go back and you read them and i and i would recommend everybody read them read them not as often as you read infallible scripture but make them part of your regular reading habits you're going to see really really fast why jesus has the debates he does with the pharisees because they are very much like the people um in those apocryphal times, uh, you know, I just, uh, I read through the whole of Judith just the other day, and you read Judith, and you realize that she's sort of the, um, the Maccabean equivalent of, uh, you know, um, JL and Deborah, and I mean, she creates, a, you know, she's, she's very much a part of that, and you can see where, where are these Sadducees, pro-Temple, pro-Israel, Zealot, where are these people coming from? From places like Judith. So, I mean, you see a lot of stuff. Another example of uh, capital T tradition would be the Apostolic Fathers. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of where I was going to jump in there, just so that we can give a concrete example. Say somebody is trying to learn and grow in their knowledge of what marriage is, for example. They've gone to the scripture, and now they want to take what they learned from the scripture, and they're going to go to something like the Apostolic Fathers. And they're going to begin to glean and look through the Apostolic Fathers and see use that word consensus. So where they all agree on these things. And then what are they going to do with that? They're going to, they're going to take that knowledge and, and, and how would they not get confused, say, from something, um, from another authority voice? Like, what are they going to do with that information? So one of the really, really key components of reading the fathers is that phrase consent that word consensus okay so okay. because you will find 
because part of the reference of the tradition of referring to the tradition of the church is acknowledging they don't agree with each other all the time. I mentioned the apocryphal text, but they don't agree with each other. So what do you do when they don't agree with each other? Um, you have to take into consideration their method of disagreement. And when that disagreement produces a council, when that disagreement produces one of the established creeds, when that disagreement produces what's considered her heretical and schismatic and then, and then is rejected by the whole of the church. So you got to take that whole process into consideration because the Holy Spirit's working all of that through the people of God. And that's already, that process is already outlined for us in the pages of the New Testament. In, in the book of Acts, the issue is Gentile inclusion into the church. Do you need to become Jewish and get circumcised and obey the Jewish laws before you can be baptized? And they have to have a council because of it. Um, the, the, the apostles are there, and then the other apostles in Jerusalem, and then the elders. So the bishops and the priests, as it were, convene together, consult the, the scripture, the, the prophets, uh, you know, David, Amos, this kind of stuff. They consult the prophets. They look at what the Spirit's actively doing on the ground. Yeah. And then the infallible scripture makes a fallible point. So it's an infallible scripture making an infallible point that's fallible, if you follow what I'm saying. Because the, 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 cre the, the fathers of that council in Acts 15 say, it seems good, seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. So in, in the infallible scripture, we're given the pattern on how the church makes its decrees. The church doesn't say, I have a prophetic word. The church doesn't say, we see these signs and these wonders and these miracles. The church, as the collection of the entirety of God's people, represented through the bishops and the priests, convene together. They consult infallible scripture. Then they consult other authorities that don't have the weight of scripture to see what is God really saying and how does God want us to understand the scripture. So that in that pattern, what is presented for us is that anybody, and this is, you'll see, you see this later on as the uh, church history develops, anybody who convenes their own local council and their own local synods, and they start making decisions that are contrary to the established consensus of the church Catholic are already schism, schisming. They're already dividing from the church, regardless of what signs and wonders they may have. Yeah. And that's where I was going, Pastor Darrell, was trying to say, look, if we've got scripture as a witness, and then we have this apostolic tradition or the tradition as a witness, where we're going is we're confronted to change. That we have to say, yeah. is my opinion, or in the beginning, as you were talking about it, and you were saying, you know, with these biases, we come to the text. If we have those two of our tools telling us something, we have to really come to a confrontation of, are we going to change? Or in my little local senate or my little local council, are we going to say we have the whole mind of Christ just here as opposed to the global consensus of the church and the uh, infallible witness of scripture. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 so there is locality. There is synodality. There, there is, there is a, um, because the, the, the microcosm of the church, like the center of the local church is the bishop. The bishop's the chief pastor. And then, um, then you have the parishes that are connected with and missions and other other agencies of ministry and, and, and what ministry works, functions, that kind of stuff, under the aegis of the bishop. Um, and that's coming right out of Luke uh, 22. So in Luke 22, when Jesus establishes um, the, the Lord's Supper, uh, the Eucharist, he tells the apostles that they will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. And he's conferring upon them authority as servant leaders, as they are then ruling Israel, i.e. the people of God, and sitting at his table. And so the basis for their authority and, and the locus for that authority is the Eucharist. And so the bishops are the, the immediate successors as a collective group, not as, not as individuals. The, the episcopacy itself is the succession of the apostles. And then the presbyters, the priests and the deacons, those, those two other orders are, are part of that, um, that episcopal order. Episcopal authority that the bishop then delegates to specific individuals, to specific persons, to to assist him in his work. That practice goes all the way back to the New Testament, all the way back, and you never see that changed. So that even we mentioned the, the schismatic and the heretical groups in the early church, they never broke that. Like their intent was not to take that away. You look at the Arians, you look at uh, 
um, any score of them. You know, that, that wasn't something they challenged. And so it becomes all the more significant that, you know, uh, the radical reformation, when that starts taking place in parts of Europe, they break that thing out and then blow it to pieces. Um, I don't want to get onto that too much right now, but I, I do want to give a word of, of uh, caution to somebody who's never read the church fathers that somehow this afternoon picks up, uh, you know, Jerome or, or Origen or Tertullian, um, not everything they say is correct. Good. Not That's every, good. not everything they say is, is, uh, a right understanding of the, the church Catholic of the Catholic doctrine of the church. Right. So I would recommend for people that are that are brand new to the idea, even that there is a capital T tradition, start with the prayer book. Because what there are, for a couple of reasons, one, the prayer book is is in English. If you're if you're watching this and you're listening and reading your Bible in English, you want to get an English book of common prayer. Obviously, I'm going to recommend the 2019 because it's brand new. Um, but if you if you're looking and you're like, I don't I don't have access to one. It's online. Or maybe you've got a paper, you've got a paper version that's not new. Any of them from 1549 into the 1550s, 1662, just find one and start working through that, because the probability that you're going to run into error working through the prayer book in conjunction with scripture is pretty low, um, because the the prayer book is an English synthesis and articulation of the Catholic theology of the church, not Roman, but of the Catholic theology of the church, rightly understood and for worship. Yeah, there, there's all that meat and taters, if you will, of the consensus and in, in very digestible ways for us mm -hmm. to get the understanding of these capital T traditions that are really helpful for us. Yeah. I, I do think if, if, if someone says, yeah, I'm ready to jump into reading into the, the church fathers, where do I start? start with the apostolic fathers so you can get that as a standalone volume yes. and there's a couple different authors in there and just about all of them knew the apostles personally um, or they were they knew the immediate successors of the apostles these guys are within three generations of the apostles so they're all very very early and um, very very organized very very articulate and i think just about all of them die as martyrs except for irenaeus i think most of them end up dying as martyrs so they, they, they are like their, their leaders, like the apostles, you know, they're, they're signing their, their testimony with their blood, like Jesus. And you can get a lot of that free online, by the way. Yeah. Um, the, the, the resource just at the fingertips is amazing on a lot of these things. Yeah. Okay. So pastor, we talked about scripture. We've talked about capital T tradition or tradition in general. And now we're, we're talking about reason and logic. And so you know, we want to just set out right from the beginning. We're talking about, I believe it was A.W. Tozer who said sanctified reasoning. And so um, let's just clear the air there, Pastor. Let's just say why uh, reason and why should it be sanctified reason? Reasoning, um, if, even if you go with the, the uh, concept of reasoning like philosophy and you read through Paul's letters, it sounds like he's condemning philosophy. Uh, he's condemning a, a, a carnal philosophy. He's condemning, he's, that's what he's coming up against. Uh, in First Corinthians, when he starts talking about um, uh, the gospel, I present was a demonstration of the Spirit's power, not in human wisdom or, or speech. It's very funny uh, or ironic because he's using ancient forms of rhetoric in his writing to prove his point. And then you have other passages um, where Paul is quoting Plato, even though he doesn't cite him. Uh, like when he talks about the body of Christ, uh, Plato, I believe in, is, is it, I'm going to get the name wrong. Plato talks about creation basically being the body of the gods. And so Paul is lifting from the philosophy of the Greeks without citing them and reinterpreting prominent Greek philosophy in light of the incarnate word. So that even the word, the term, the word logos that John uses, that we translate word, was used by the Stoic philosophers. And the Stoics used the, for, the word logos to refer to, a, to an ethereal, fiery mist, like a fiery vapor that, it, that, that subsisted throughout the entire cosmos and held everything together. 
And then you have other philosophers who will then, um, all, all some of that stoic vein, will talk about God's impassibility, meaning like he can't be touched by us. Because if God is impacted by us, then he's moved. And, you know, Aristotle says that can't be the case. And so they say the logos is what is between God who can't be moved and us who are always changing. You know, it's impossible for us not to be moved. La da da, la da da, la da da. We go into lots of philosophy here. So I bring that up because when Paul says, be careful of people who are taking you captives through vain philosophies, he has in mind the misappropriation of those things as antithesis to scripture, but the, uh, or, or in violation of God's clear revelation in Jesus Christ. He's not against reason. I mean, his articles or his articles, his writings are very reasonable. They're very rational. I mean, even the presentation of the resurrection is set up as a legal court, uh, as a legal case. Here are these eyewitnesses. Here are these eyewitnesses. Here are these eyewitnesses over and over and over again, reinforcing the rational disposition of the claim of Scripture. But all of that is in submission to the authority of Scripture and doesn't exist as its own argumentation. One of the plagues uh, that we're, we are contending with in our Western culture and it's not denomination specific. It's happening to, to all the Christian bodies in the West. Um, and in some cases, it's made significant headways. And in some cases, it's not on the floors. There are natural, national conventions yet, but it's going to be in 10 years. Um, it's really the elevation of reason over tradition so that reason is how we are interpreting scripture and not tradition. And this is important because if if the scripture didn't mean what it meant and what it has meant, and we would call that tradition, if it doesn't mean it then, or if it's, if it's meaning is subjective and that we can change it. So you can't get, the, you can't get to that argument unless you go by, unless you go scripture, reason, tradition. If you do that, then you can make the scripture mean what you want. And that's what exactly what is happening. And so the people who have ardent prayer lives, who are, who are, who are wonderful scholars, who know what it is to, to study the scripture and, 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 and in many cases quote the Bible better than their fundamentalist counterparts and have a more richer, more consistent, more focused prayer life. And even in some cases, multiple signs and wonders confirming what they're doing have elevated reason over tradition so that now the things that the scripture clearly prohibits, they acknowledge and, and recommend as the righteousness of God being revealed for a contemporary need. Right. This is this is a this is why this is important because and if you if you get into prayer meetings you get into to to gospel sessions with most of these folks you're not going to know that they they agree with all of your doctrine about God and your doctrine about Christ for the most part but then when it comes into their anthropology how humans relate to one another it breaks down because they've elevated reason and human reason over the tradition of the church which was given by the Holy Spirit tradition is a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit to the church to teach us what the scripture means so we don't create our own errors. Yeah, and, and I think this is why we have to make it so clear and important that this has to be a mind sanctified by the Spirit under submission to the Lordship of Christ. And as we're using that mind, you said it before, you said it, if you come up with something new when you're reading the scripture, you should probably be alarmed. If yeah. you come up with something new that is uh, beyond what has already been thought, by the consensus of the church, you should probably be alarmed. But Very what much. we are saying, though, is as we are going through these uh, these tools or these steps, sanctified reasoning really is a gift. It yeah. is a gift to uh, to be able to discern truth, um, uh, basic things, and 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 uh, uh, we we look at someone touching a stove and they burn themselves. Um, you know, your reason is telling you, look don't touch that stove. Yeah. So um, we, we want to be able to say this is an important gift. And, 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 and Pastor, I'm bringing this up because of a nuance here that I'd like you to elaborate on. Sometimes what's, what's, what's um, extolled in, in some of our Christian circles is that loving the Lord your God with your mind is less important than loving the Lord your God with your heart. And so we're, we're not using the mind that God gave us as a gift. Can you elaborate on that? So Paul emphasizes and he mentions continually that we have the mind of Christ. And when he says that we have the mind of Christ, he's not talking about us individually. He's saying all y'all. 
So the church gathered together, rightly ordered according to scripture has the mind of Christ. So the consensus of the church has the mind of Christ, not my individual perception or judgment has the mind of Christ. Also, um, when you're talking about how we, how we, oh man, how can I say this? The, the mind of, let's back that up for a second. Let me back up. Maybe I'm jumping too far ahead in my own thought here to, to spill it out the right way. Having the mind of Christ is reasonable because it's built upon infallible scripture, right. rightly understood by the tradition. So, for example, in the Gospels, when Jesus is debating with the Pharisees about resurrection, remember the account where they come to him and they, they give him this fake scenario about the woman who's had seven brothers for her husband, one in a row, and neither one could raise a child and her children, you know, whose wife will she be at the resurrection? Right. And Jesus quotes to them, uh, he says, you know, neither the scripture nor the power of God. Because, and then he quotes um, uh, from the law, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see that he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. That, from what historians tell us, that was one of the anchor texts that the Sadducees used to define themselves by. And so Jesus took the very text that they used to define themselves by, and they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't believe in angels, and they didn't believe in the Maccabean um, you know, accounts we read about, the Maccabees with Jeremiah and that kind of – they didn't believe in any of that. He takes the very thing that was their central point of reasoning – and then rightly reasons that in a way to correct them. You can't do that if you don't believe in reason, if you don't believe in logic and how those things are governed by scripture and then governed by tradition. Um, it's, a, it's an important distinction that we have to keep in mind so we don't end up running into an error, of, again, of elevating reason over tradition and reason over scripture. Yeah, and I want to encourage everybody out there, if you're looking for a fair and good um, teaching on this, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas does an excellent job talking about, um, uh, I shouldn't say, using these, these uh, logic and reason in his own teaching. So you'll, when you're reading St. Thomas Aquinas, you catch a lot of, um, uh, of a man who's done a good job balancing out logic, reason, scripture, and spirit, tradition. Uh, obviously, he's not infallible, but yeah, I mean, let me say this about Aquinas. Um, Aquinas is a theological juggernaut, so if you're going to disagree with him, please make sure that you're able to disagree with him at his level. Don't be a guy holding a squirt gun against the fellow holding, uh, you know, the, the, the fireman's hose, because uh, that's what that's who Aquinas is. He's he's got the, the fireman's hose, and don't approach him with a squirt gun and tell him where he's wrong if you're not gonna come to him on his level. Um, also, Aquinas has gotten a bad rap, and others of his era of, uh, you know, debating about how many angels can stand on the head of a pin, which he doesn't, by the way, even though he's called the angel doctor. Aquinas and the guys of his era are very much sort of like this, and, and this comes from um, Chesterton. Um, if a unicorn, you got to follow me now. Uh oh unicorns, here okay. we go. If a unicorn has one horn, then one ox has as many horns as two unicorns. Whoa. Folks, we have just jumped into the deep end of the kiddie pool, so watch out. So he ends up saying it's, it's speculative. If this, then that. If this, then that. So he's making use, as you mentioned, of logic. He's working through a sanctified, thoroughly Christianized, as much as they understand it to be thoroughly Christianized, approach to working out um, theological points and issues. Yeah. yeah. And I think we, so we don't elaborate on this further, you know, when, when you want to, you want to be able to take these things with sanctified reasoning so that you don't end up in a dangerous place um, where you're jumping into the kiddie pool and hurting yourself. So don't jump into the kiddie pool kids on the deep end. I'll tell you what, if somebody's wanting to get to do some theological study, I would recommend Thomas Aquinas over almost any popular uh, devotional reading today. Agreed. I just would. Yeah. Okay, so now we're, we're, we're coming up and wrapping this up now. We're talking about this last leg that Wesley, last tool that Wesley has for us on experience. Um, why experience? Why is this important to help us discern truth? 
because truth has to be practical. Wesley was a master of practical divinity. So it's got to be tangible. It's got to produce fruit. What does it look like? Is, is, is this something that's actually transforming and changing people? And of all of the, what we could call, I'll say modern um, church, in, in the modern church, and I would, I would say Wesley's at the very beginning of that, you know, being in the, in the 1700s. Um, what man uh, preached and had the kind of awakening that he did and retained many of the converts so that they become so big, they become an entirely different uh, distinct tradition. Um, you know, with, with the Methodists that, that develop afterwards, after him, well, while he's leading them, but then they become a different, you know, different body after him. Um, you can see the effect. You can see the pragmatic practicality. You can see the experience being tangibly observed. Now, what he's not saying is that what you feel is correct. Correct. There you go. Experience doesn't mean that what I think is true is true. Experience also doesn't mean that particular charism or grace on my life is the grace that God has given to everyone. I learned along uh, really early after coming to the Lord, um, after a few months of becoming a Christian, that I, I was able to, um, to pray in a group of people, like lead people in prayer, without anything in front of me. It just sort of bubbled up and spilled over, and, and people were moved by that. I used to think a long time ago, and when this was happening, I used to think God did that for everybody. Well, he doesn't do that. Some people aren't able to do that. They, they, they're not able to pray that way. They need a prayer book. Um, and I'm not saying that you, I mean, I, I use it all the time myself. So I, please understand what I mean there. But you can say the same with gifts of healing or gifts of prophecy or gifts of administration or gifts of you know, whatever. The spirit gives out multiple gifts and spreads those out amongst the body so that the whole body becomes interdependent one upon the other to grow into maturity and to growth. So our own personal experience cannot be the measure by which we judge the church Catholic. We have to understand that our personal experience fits in to the church Catholic and that the church Catholic defines and, and chisels, you know, breaks off those rough edges on, our, on us. So that we, we are a, a living stone built into the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's really what experience is. Uh, because otherwise, everybody, everybody that thinks God's talking to them will then run, run off and create their own denomination, their own church, their own institution. And oh, we see that in America all the time. You know? So I'm thinking if I can give an example, and you tell me if I'm, if I'm getting this right from Wesley. Wesley's more in line experientially of saying, you know, when you and I were younger, younger pastors, um, we ran into the, uh, the quick lesson that if you always drop the hammer on people in the proverbial way, um, you know, it, to, to him who only has the hammer in a tool bag, then everything is a nail. Yeah. So you end up running people off or driving them away. And you learn early on that you have to have experientially you learn you have to have more tools in your tool belt some people are going to need a stiffer rebuke other people are going to need the inch by inch walking along pastoring as they're as they're coming along would you say this is more of what wesley is saying a more sanctified re, uh, experience yeah yeah well, if you want a patristic source i would refer to uh, gregory gregory the great's pastoral rule which he wrote in the late 500s early 600s um and gregory's book there was so it's so incredibly practical, experiential in this sense, that Alfred the Great, uh, who becomes, he's the only monarch in England who, who's called the Great. Um, Alfred the Great required that Gregory's pastoral rule be read by every priest being, set, being consecrated as a bishop. That's how practical and pragmatic it is. Because in it, Gregory's dealing with how do you correct, how do you give out rebukes, how do you, all of that stuff you have to take into consideration who you're talking to. And I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to cite him again because of mentioning him once today and then once yesterday um, with Augustine and how he, he pastorally counseled Augustine in the conversion of uh, the Anglo-Saxons and what that looked like. Because, and here's another, I mean, I wouldn't even think of it like this, but here's another example of that experience, practical approach to implementing theology. When the, when the British, when the, the Roman Empire collapsed in the West, um, there was no 
the church in Britain, like Roman Britain, had been slowly declining over like for a long time, so that there wasn't even like a history that there was a church still there. Some modern historians are trying to say that it looks like there may have been, but they didn't think so in Rome, which is why Rome sends a, a delegation of missionaries. They knew about the Celtic Church. Celtic Church was that the Celtic Church was in the midst of uh, roaring, flaming revival, as we would call it today. Um, of course, if we went back there, most of us would not appreciate their ascetic lifestyle, <laughs> or uh, some other things that I won't mention right now. Um, but those people who were ablaze didn't convert the Anglo-Saxons. It didn't happen. It was the mission of Gregory through Augustine of Canterbury, with the order and form and dignity of their worship. Um, that brought the Anglo-Saxons to convert. All of that stemming from experience, like the scripture, the tradition, and reason, taking into consideration the experience of those people and how they have to hear that to grow and to be converted. That's a, that's a, that's a mass evangelism, a mass evangelistic uh, illustration, but the, the principle, I think, still stands. That's good, Pastor. So uh, just in review... We're trying to give you guys the tools in your tool belt so that as you're in a postmodern culture that is telling you there is no truth and that everybody's truth is the truth, we're trying to give you some tools here. By looking back to some of the Wesley's great gifts to the church, one of them here is the quadrilateral of going the scripture first and primary as the infallible source, uh, the tradition of the church, sanctified reason, and sanctified experience as tools to help you discern the truth. Uh, Pastor, would you would you pray for us? Um, th this can be mind numbing at times because we're faced daily with decisions where we have to figure out what the truth is. How do we act upon it? Would you pray for us and leave us with a blessing? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the King of all. We ask that your presence and your power would rain down upon us, yes, that your truth would inspire us and lead us, and that we would not fall into any error through the might of your Holy Spirit who lives and abides with us forever. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So, my friends, would you please sh share the video? Let's get these tools out there for people. And we thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time.